This is Colonia Cast, episode 15. We're really excited to have you back. Thanks for joining us today. Obviously, a, a huge shout out to our, our sponsors, The Turtle Room, who has generously given us kind of support uh, for this project and some startup resources. Uh, we also kind of had something exciting this week. We launched the official Colonia Cast website. Uh, you can find us at theturtleroom.org slash Colonia Cast. Uh, we have a little description of the, 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 the project there. Uh, as well as a donation box, actually, for the Colonia Cast Student Research Fund uh, that I, I've heard. I don't necessarily see kind of how that that works, but I've heard that it's going pretty well. So thank you to all of our, our donors so far. We just launched that this week. Uh, and the goal there is obviously to support uh, student research at all levels of, of a student uh, and, and, and with a focus on turtles. So Today, we've got a really exciting show for you. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Peter Lindemann, who is in the uh, Department of, of Biology and Health Sciences at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Lindemann has published over 60 uh, peer-reviewed publications on, on turtles, uh, sort of focusing on the map turtles and sawbacks within the genus Graptomys. He's also the author of the Map Turtle and Sawback Atlas, uh, which is sort of the, the, the go-to encyclopedia uh, on this group of turtles and and one of the most, if not the most detailed sort of publication on one sort of genus of turtles. Uh, it, it's a, a great book. I know at least two of us have read front to back. Uh, so definitely make sure to go pick that up uh, if you want some more info than we can cover today. Uh, but thanks for joining us, Dr. Lindemann. We're really excited to have you on. Thank you. Good day and, and thanks for having me on today. Right on. Uh, to get going here, um, we kind of ask everyone this, and you know, there's not really a better question to start the podcast with. So, uh, what got you interested in turtles? Oh well, uh, it kind of goes way back. I uh, had a childhood friend who I uh, went on weekends to the Oklahoma City Zoo with. So we were enrolled in a young herpetologist program and going behind the scenes in their Herp building that they uh, have at the Oklahoma City Zoo. Uh, that was early elementary school, like first or second grade age. And so I, I knew I was interested in herpetology then. I went off uh, to the university as an undergrad student at Eastern Illinois University, and I was majoring in zoology, thinking of herpetology. And when it came time to start graduate school, I had a major professor at the University of Idaho, Dick Wallace, who he was a, a herpetologist and ichthyologist. And he wrote to me and suggested that I might come to Idaho and either study painted turtles in North Idaho or long-toed salamander or bass populations in a couple of uh, reservoirs. And I wasn't so interested in the bass, but the herpetology stuff sounded pretty interesting. And I thought the painted turtles sounded more interesting than the long toed salamanders. By the time I finished uh, my master's program, I had accumulated a stack of photocopied uh, journal articles. Back then, you rarely got a hold of a uh, 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 reprint and there were, were no PDFs and so you just spent your time over at the library a nickel at a time making photocopies of things and I had such a tall stack of turtle papers that I couldn't imagine going into some other field for my PhD so I just stuck with the turtles and eventually got into map turtles once I moved back east. That's really interesting uh, you know the Graptomys are such an interesting group of turtles in terms of a genus, especially just in, in turtles in general, they're pretty speciose. I think Trachomys has them beat by a, a few. Um, right. Yeah, I'm not sure about others, but but I think it's about 14 species in the genus. And, and you know, initially, I typically think that there's two things that kind of stand out initially. And obviously, there's a lot more. And you can find that, obviously, in the Map Turtle and Sawback Atlas. There's a lot more to dig in. Uh, but the things that kind of stand out to me, the first thing is the sort of pronounced, I guess, sexual size dimorphism that you'll get in, in Graptomys to varying degrees, right? Um, and then the second thing is sort of the, the pattern with which they're kind of distributed. Uh, you'll have 
in, in Gulf Coast drainage is typically one uh, megacephalic species that also typically gets larger, uh, co-occurring with, with a smaller species with a species with a smaller head, right? Which looks like a certain pattern of character displacement that maybe when they sort of coalesced within those drainages that they diverge in terms of their trophic kind of morphology to decrease the amount of competition that would occur. But so one of the things that you analyzed is the, uh, is, is kind of the, how those trophic morphology and body size relates within map turtles. Uh, and you use some interesting analytical methods there. Uh, but maybe you could just kind of expand upon that and, and, and sort of what, what are we really seeing evolutionarily? Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was something that drew me to the genus uh, initially. When I finished at Idaho, I moved to Kentucky, and I was uh, in a teaching position at a community college there. Eventually, I started working on a Ph.D. in uh, the summers and in little nooks and crannies of free time that I had. And I got very interested in the genus Graptomys because I could see from uh, back then it was the third edition of the Peterson Field Guide that had uh, range maps drawn with little uh, little squiggles for rivers that uh, that their ranges extended up into. And I've always liked being out on rivers. I do a lot of canoeing and done that since I was a child. So that was appealing to me. And as I started diving into the literature, I could see that there was a lot of information on uh, variation between the sexes and variation between the species in their trophic morphology. Uh, a lot of people had taken measurements of that information, but nobody had sat down and analyzed it all and, uh, and kind of uh, put it all together to tell the story of the graptomies. And I've told many people over the years that I, I, I sort of have a recurring feeling in studying graptomies that uh, I'll be studying some subject having to do with the trophic morphology or the diet or size dimorphism. And I think, how, how is it that in the 1990s or the early 2000s or the 2000 teens how, how is it that nobody has done this study before me and so i feel very fortunate that uh some of the people who were studying graptomies before i got into the field left me with plenty of uh, very interesting questions to look at uh regarding uh, things like size dimorphism sexual size dimorphism and trophic morphology and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I, when I was working on my PhD, I was doing a community ecology study in Western Kentucky where I lived. And I had two graphic species there, the, the Mississippi map turtle. It's kind of an intergrade population, but more Mississippi than false map turtle there and the Wachita map turtle. So I had those two species among uh, five species that I was studying for community ecology. And I just decided there needed to be another chapter in my dissertation, which was gonna involve running around uh, museum collections. Uh, uh, I went down to Mississippi and Alabama at Auburn uh, and three different universities in uh, Texas. I went to the Carnegie Museum and a few other places and just took all the measurements that I could get of, you know, some of the same stuff that people had measured in their previous studies, but nobody had put it all together for all the graptomies at once just so that you could uh, do a, a comparison of all 14 species in the genus. And so I decided I was going to do that as part of my dissertation. Uh, grew a new chapter for my dissertation out of that work. And that that had more influence on what I would go on to do than the original community ecology work that I was doing for that dissertation. That's that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that that was sort of a, a, a branch of your of your dissertation. I think mm -hmm. I think I've read the the community ecology one at the the lake in, in Kentucky. 
Uh, that was something interesting for me personally. I've been working on a, a project with Western pond turtles and reddered sliders. And actually, I sort of analyzed kind of how the species are basking uh, using kind of the, the chi-square similarity uh, based on kind of where we saw them basking different basking platforms. But some of the methodologies you used in that paper, the, I guess, proportional similarity index for overlap is something that I'm interested in. Yeah, in potentially looking at how that applies to to the the sliders and pond turtles and using that to quantify, I guess, niche overlap. That that's sort of a different thing than graph means, obviously. Um, but yeah, that so that that's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe what are I think the first thing that's interesting is is the size, the overall body size versus head width. And mm -hmm. I I think that we a lot of times maybe take that for granted as something that's correlated. Um, but if I'm, if I'm not incorrect, you've sort of analyzed these things within a phylogenetic sort of framework, as opposed to just looking at contemporary variability and correlation between head width and body size. You use sort of a, the, the contrast method, right? Maybe you could expand upon right. that word. Yeah, uh, so independent contrast had... Uh, come into uh, 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 ecological analyses, I guess, in the mid-1980s, and I was doing my dissertation work in the early and mid-1990s. And so I got interested in using that to uh, look for differences or correlations in my data while taking into account uh, the, the uh, uh, relationships of the species, some closer relationships and some more distant relationships. What you often find when you do that is your correlation coefficient that you derive from just, you know, having a couple of columns of data, a column of uh, one measurement on each species and a column of a second measurement on each species. If you just run a correlation coefficient on that, you may get a pretty high correlation coefficient, which is going to lead to a statistical significance. But then once you run it through independent contrast, correcting for the, the varying degree of relationships that species have, typically what happens is the correlation coefficient drops. And sometimes it drops so far that it becomes no longer significant. And so that's what I found in the, uh, the first round of uh, that sort of analyses I did was with looking at the width of the head at the upper jaw in graptomies and the width of the alveolar surfaces of the upper jaw, the crushing surfaces that are inside the mouth. And uh, when I ran just simple correlation coefficients for all my species and I had different populations were three of the more widespread species. If I just did a correlation coefficient, everything was correlated with everything. So uh, correlation within the females, correlation within the males, correlation between males and females for head width and correlation between males and females for alveolar width. And that's uh, maybe slightly interesting if that's the case, but it's not terribly interesting to say everything is correlated with everything. Uh, when I reran it with independent contrasts, all the correlation coefficients came down somewhat. Uh, the one that came way down was the correlation within the males. Of course, the males are the little ones in graptomies. And Typically, they're not eating a lot of mollusks. If they are, they're eating very small uh, snails and very small Asian clams and that sort of thing. The females are the one that are the ones that are really impressing you with the crushing ability that they have with their jaws. They they grow much larger and uh, have a relatively larger heads, uh, at, at least in some of the species. And so uh, the females maintained a significant correlation in uh, those analyses between head width and alveolar width. And what you're really analyzing at that point, once you go to the independent contrast, you're not just saying, is head width correlated with alveolar width? You're saying, 
are the uh, estimated changes in head width and estimated changes in alveolar width correlated with one another. Uh, and so I was finding that they were for the females and not for the males. And then the uh, correlations between the sexes were kind of intermediate. So males, the little males are tracking what the big females are doing over the course of their evolutionary history, but not very precisely, not very closely. So the correlation between changes in head width and changes in alveolar width for males kind of breaks down and loses significance, whereas it remains highly significant for the females. And they're the ones that uh, in some species, they're eating virtually nothing but mollusks. Uh, an Alabama map turtle, a Pascagoula or pearl map turtle, barber's map turtle, that's all they eat. Uh, others uh, like the common map turtle and uh, the Mississippi map turtle, they're eating mostly mollusks, but often mixed with other types of prey. And then you have species like the three sawbacks and uh, Sabine map turtles, Wachita map turtles, uh, the big female in those species. Uh, first of all, they're not all that big. They're not all that large bodied. Uh, they do have relatively wider heads than the males, but they're not using them uh, in most cases to take on much in the way of hard body prey. They're eating a lot of algae, aquatic insects, and sponges in some species, and uh, things of that sort. That's an, it's an interesting way to look at that. I think in a lot of cases it gets, when we're doing correlation analyses, or I guess regression analyses with measurable continuous characters, or, or sort of, I guess, any type of predictors, you can kind of, depending on the method of analysis, you can correct for a lot of different things. But a lot of times when you're comparing it among species, we don't think about the fact that really in, in a phylogenetic sense, species are not necessarily fully independent in terms of those those traits that you're measuring, right? It's, it's something that's, they're, they're right. still sort of dependent upon the past state, right? Right. Yeah. They're, uh, the easiest way to think about it is that uh, some are rather closely related. Some are only more distantly related. And when you go back to common ancestry, at common ancestry, every had, everybody had uh, pretty much the same head width or the same alveolar width or whatever your trait is. Uh, so you're looking at divergence in those traits since the common ancestor diverged into the uh, its descendant species. And it makes for a very interesting uh, form of analysis, and uh, it's, it's a little exercise in statistics because people rarely think about the, uh, the part of statistical analysis that says all your data points are supposed to be independent. So even if if I'm studying something completely different, like uh, catching turtles and gathering data on clutch size or egg size or something of that nature, even in cases like that, I, I want my data to be independent. So if I catch the same female twice and I get two different clutches from her, I will uh, either either just randomly select one for the analysis or what I usually do is average the two and use that as her value. So each female goes in to the data set once. When I do dietary studies, uh, if I get recaptures, they don't have to come to my hotel room and sit in a plastic bucket overnight and produce a sample for me. They've already done their job. Uh, of course, I keep keep tabs on who didn't do their job. Occasionally you get a turtle that doesn't produce a sample. And if I catch that again the next year, maybe I'll take another stab at it. But but that way you, you keep your uh, data points for any analyses you're going to do independent of one another, which is always a good thing. Yeah, that's definitely in, in something that maybe it, it's more intuitive in certain cases than, than others, right? The, the certain areas, it's it's obvious kind of how you parse those things out. In other places, you might have to think a little bit harder about it. Um, right. I, I sort of want to backtrack maybe a bit 
to uh, the second thing about the Garotomies in terms of how they're kind of distributed. You get it, it's not a foolproof pattern. Obviously, you've got the 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 uh, the Chikasahe I, I, or not the Chikasahe, the uh, Chakta Watch, where you've got two megacephalics that sort of come into into uh, I guess right. symmetry there. But but it's mostly a, it's a, it's a pretty conserved pattern that you see one microcephalic species cohabitating with a larger bodied megacephalic species mm -hmm. with respect to the females, right? You spoke about how that's the megacephaly over time is more correlated with size and females. But mm -hmm. so in terms of the analysis you've done, you also kind of looked at how allopatry versus sympatry with another turtle has affected or if there is an influence that that has on body size change over time. Maybe right. could, like, so, so is that, I, what does that prove sort of evolutionarily about the, these well, turtles? I, I analyzed that with respect to the, the three species pairs that have a microcephalic sawback together with a megacephalic. So that would be the, uh, in the Pearl River, you have the ring sawback together with the, pearl map turtle and then right next door in the Pascagoula River you have the, the uh, yellow blotch sawback with the Pascagoula map turtle and then uh, right next door to them over in Alabama you get uh, the Mobile Bay drainages of Alabama and a little bit of uh, Mississippi as well that have black knob sawbacks with Alabama map turtles so the three sawbacks smaller bodied and uh, narrower heads, little to no mollusks in the diet generally. And the, uh, the other three, the megacephalics, uh, you put a female, great big female, uh, pearl or Pascagoula or Alabama map turtle in a bucket overnight with some water in it. And uh, she will leave behind uh, an incredible pile of mollusk shells, mostly Asian clams these days, but sometimes smaller native unionid shells and uh, sometimes snail shells as, as well. And so I was interested in whether the body size difference between the females of those species, if that is uh, something consistent with character displacement. And uh, so we also have two megacephalics the Escambia map turtle and the uh, Barber's map turtle that don't have a sawback or any other graptomies living in, in uh, their river. So they're allopatric. And uh, I thought, well, uh, you know, if, if there is this character displacement with regard to body size, if the uh, putting two species together makes them diverge and one gets bigger and one smaller, then you ought to see something a little more intermediate in these allopatric populations. So I was able to uh, do some analyses uh, in an article in Herptologica that was out in 2008 that looked at that and I simply uh, put it in as a categorical variable, uh, something like zero for sympatric and one for allopatric or vice versa. I don't remember which way I had it. But I put that in there and asked whether that was capturing any of uh, the extra variation in body size. So uh, after you look at whether they're micro, meso, or megacephalic, does sympatry or allopatry have anything to do with it? And I didn't find any effect in that. Uh, what I've concluded about the megacephalics, and I have a picture in my book somewhere of some barbers map turtles a whole bunch of females on the same log together and i just kind of ask people to imagine well these turtles that have these great big heads and barbers map turtle they're the champions they have the widest heads of any of the megacephalics so if you take those turtles and imagine well what if they had the same width of the head, width of the jaw, the same muscle mass in, uh, in and around their jaws, but you made their shell length uh, an inch or two shorter. So make them sawback sized 
but with heads like they have, and I don't think they'd be able to carry themselves around. I don't think they'd be able to haul up onto a log and bask with that gigantic head and a smaller body. Uh, I have some x-rays of uh, the Alabama map turtle, another megacephalic. It's actually got the, the least uh, hypertrophy head of all the five megacephalics. It's a little smaller than a, a pearl or Pascagoula map turtle in head size, but I have some x-rays I took for my reproductive study that I published recently. And to see the head withdrawn into the shell and the volume of that space inside the body that the head takes up in, a, in an x-ray, uh, it's, it's really astounding. And I think, well, you know, they're a good bit larger than black knob sawbacks, but I don't think that's competitive uh, or competition related character displacement. I think that's, uh, they had better be bigger or they're not going to be able to carry that head around that, that they have. And if they don't have a head like that, they can't crush up the mollusk that they're trying to eat. So I think uh, in a way, it's a little bit of a trap for those megacephalics because to be large bodied, they have to uh, mature quite a bit later. We don't, we don't have great estimates of what the age at maturation is for those species, but it seems to be something like 12, 14, 16 years of age for the females. Uh, meanwhile, sawbacks and some of the other species, uh, my common map turtles uh, up at Lake Erie here in Pennsylvania, you know, they're the females of those species are maturing when they're uh, five, six, seven, eight years of age. And the megacephalics are being pushed to delay maturation, I think, uh, because of the need for a very large body to be able to carry around a very large head necessary for crushing the mollusk that they feed on. Uh, and that, that may have something to do with the conservation situation because those species, uh, uh, they generally speaking, they lag behind the sawbacks that they are sympatric with uh, or uh, in the case of uh, the Mississippi map turtle, which is mesocephalic, they, they lag behind the Wachita map turtle in abundance. What, uh, okay. Oh, I was Go gonna ahead, Jack. I, I kind of have a question about uh, the dietary makeup of like barber map, barber's map turtles in comparison to like the rest of the megacephalics. Like it seemed that they were like the last ones to kind of go over towards, to lean towards corbicula. Like just reading through the book, right. all the others seemed it's like corbicula is a staple of their diet. While it seems like for some of the barbers, at least it's still almost exclusively snails. Yeah, that there's a the biggest study of their diet uh, came out in the 1970s. Sanderson uh, is part of a master's thesis. That may, and it was, it was in a tributary river, the Chipola River, uh, uh, not on the main stem, Apalachicola. Uh, that may have been uh, uh, just because 19, early 1970s when he was gathering his specimens, uh, uh, gathering the samples from them. That was about the time Corbicula was hitting all the southeastern rivers. There's a, an article about Corbicula from 1982. Author's name is McMahon, and he has a map of the United States that shows the dates of when Corbicula showed up. Uh, in the eastern U.S., they show up around Louisville, Kentucky, 1957, and then all along the Gulf Coast, it dates from the 1970s. So I think we lucked out with that master's thesis in getting somebody to study them right before things changed. Uh, I, when I studied Texas map turtles some years ago, 20 years ago now, uh, I was uh, gathering samples from animals I was catching in the wild, but I also knew of a large sample that were in the Baylor University Museum. 
and they let me borrow half their large series. So it was, I think I cut open 21 out of 42 turtles to look at what they were eating. These have been collected back in 1949. So I had 1949 and I was catching my turtles. Uh, my big year of catching them was 1999. So I had a 50 year gap to look at and there were no corbicula whatsoever in the 1949 specimens. The corbicula just hadn't made it to the Eastern US yet, uh, but they were predominant. They were the main thing the females were eating in 1999. Uh, 1998, 1999, 2000, I guess. Uh, so uh, that was another opportunity to see that change. Uh, uh, corbicula now does seem to be in the diet of, of Barber's map turtle, uh, but it, it would be interesting to look at Barber's map turtles from a, a few different localities. And maybe there, there may still be some localities where Corbicula, they're not going to be absent, but maybe they're rare. Look at what they're eating in that situation versus places where corbicula are super abundant and that's just it's just too easy for them. That's that's what they eat all day long. Uh, I uh, I spent a little time out on on the a small little tributary of the Chipola and this particular tributary is literally blanketed in, I think there were some corbicula predominantly in there, but some other maybe native species interspersed, but we kayaked down. I didn't actually see any barbers, map turtles in the tributary itself, but immediately once we hit the main stem, they were all, I mean, at least 30 plus in, in this area. I'm going to guess that was Spring Creek. Yes, Spring Creek. Yep. I've been it myself. <laughs> I had much the same experience. I wasn't seeing them on Spring Creek, but then they're out there on, on the Chipola River. So. Yeah, it was interesting because someone had written something about going there in like the early 2000s or kind of maybe like right before 2010, sometime in that range. And they mentioned that they didn't see any map turtles. They caught an alligator snapping turtle, but did not see any map turtles. It's not clear to me, though, if they turned around once they got to the confluence with the Chipola itself, because my yeah. experience, once I got to the main stem, I mean, there were a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, anybody can hit a river on a bad day. Uh, I've occasionally heard people say, well, I went to some spot and I didn't see any of the graptomies that are supposed to live there. Uh, and I think they're just in terrible trouble. And then I go there, or I go a little upstream or downstream from where they've been. And if you make repeated visits, uh, if they're there, you'll find them. You won't see them every single time. Uh, but if, you know, because if you, if you show up at a site, you don't know if a boat just went through there or somebody was on the bank fishing right before you came through or some other animal, a, a heron or something was flying by, maybe disturbing the turtles but if you go there repeatedly you're going to eventually hit it when the turtles are out if they're present and more often than not they're they are present uh, uh, I, I i've become convinced with graptomies that because their habitat is linear basically the they're the you know their habitat is marked in all the Rand mcnally atlases with blue stripe Right. And that's their habitat. And it's linear, continuous. Some parts of it are better for the turtles and some are not so good. But uh, it's actually rather rare for one stretch to be completely extirpated of a graptomies species. It does not happen all that often. Some stretches may be sinks where uh, individuals are migrating in and then within that area their death rate exceeds the hatching rate and so they act as a sink uh, for the source populations. That's certainly possible but uh, dispersal in graptomies is a fairly simple thing. You just swim and uh, swim until you find the part of the river that 
that has a lot of food and good basking opportunities, nesting beaches, etc. Uh, so they're they're very continuously distributed. And I've I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, there's some stretch that they visited, and it's usually one time, and they say that uh, the graptomies seem to be just absent there. But it's it's rather unusual to have historical records somewhere where you can't find them at all. Now, there are a lot of places where you can't find them at nearly the same abundance. So that's your indicator that uh, that there is a conservation situation for some, many of the Grafton species. A lot of places you can't find them at nearly the abundance that people reported from the 70s or the 60s or the 50s, uh, going back to Fred Cagle's day. Uh, but to completely lose them from a stretch is, seems rather rare and unusual. So if you don't find the graptomies you're looking for uh, the, the first time you go somewhere, go back again. Try it again. Try it a few times and make sure you're not seeing them. Yes, this happened... Go ahead. We're working. We have a little time lag with the video. So yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, I think that that probably applies to a lot of different, a lot of different riverine turtles in general. I mean, sure. If you go there once, you might uh out. But uh, in your uh, experience, how does how do like the impoundments on rivers affect uh if they do at all like the head size and like just overall abundance of the megacephalic map turtles, the barbers and uh, uh like black sheep or something. Yeah, it, I, I think the, the first question you have to ask is what kind of an impoundment are you talking about? Uh, and I talk a little bit about this in my book uh, because uh, river impoundments tend to kind of fall into two groups. You have the, uh, the dams that make a run of the river reservoir where the residence time of the water behind the dam or upstream of the dam is measured in weeks or maybe a few months. And the uh, if you look at uh, that kind of a reservoir on something like Google Earth, it's a little wider and a little deeper up above the dam, and it's a little narrower and shallower below the dam. But both sections kind of look like river. They just look like river of different sizes, right? Uh, Graptomies seem like, by and large, they can do pretty well in that kind of a habitat. Now, if you put a dam on a river and back up the water and make a big, uh, what they call a dendritic <clears throat> reservoir, dendritic as in branching like a tree, so all the creeks that came into the main stem river, each of them becomes an arm or a cove of the river and uh, the whole thing is uh, looks kind of like the veins on a leaf. Uh, that kind of a reservoir is going to be very, very lentic. The, the residence time of the water in it is going to be measured in many months, if not in a few years. Uh, so the water that flows in from the last free flowing stretch of the stream up above that comes in uh, sits there behind the dam for two or three years before it finally makes its way through. Uh, and that sort of a situation doesn't seem to be uh, nearly as hospitable for, at least for some of the, the species, especially further south. The Gulf Coastal endemics uh, often have problems with that. Watch a tensus uh, in the... Uh, uh, Mississippi River drainage system and Suda Geographica and Geographica, uh, they seem to do a little bit better in that. So uh, that would be my first question about uh, looking at a reservoir. Is it one of these big, fat, lake-like reservoirs, or is it a skinnier, more river-like reservoir? The more river-like it is, uh, the or you're going to have craft to meet in it. And if it's extremely spiked, uh, 
you may see uh, very low abundance. Give you one example, uh, Ross Barnett Reservoir is the big reservoir on the Pearl River. Great big earthen dam, backs up the water. It's, uh, uh, it's actually the Pearl River backed up and a little tributary, Pulahatchee Creek. And you can take a boat around that reservoir and see river cooters and red-eared sliders just by, uh, uh, you sometimes come across logs that will have 20 or 30 river cooters, red-eared sliders. You will see some pearl map turtles and some ring sawbacks, but you will have to work really hard to find them. Uh, and they, they're probably, uh, uh, they're, they're probably remnant individuals who are a little bit confused about why the habitat is not so much to their liking and probably the food sources are a little bit uh, off for them. Uh, as soon as you go below the dam to that reservoir, then it's uh, ring sawbacks are the predominant species in that stretch below and the, uh, uh, the pearl maps are there as well and in moderately decent abundance. And uh, uh, so they're among the predominant species again, but in the reservoir itself, uh, that's one of those more dendritic reservoirs. That's a reservoir with very high residence time, I, I would imagine. And uh, it's, it's a river cooter and red eared slider paradise. Not so great for uh, these more riverine type species. That's interesting too, considering that kind of would affect the more, I guess, meso or microcephalic species more so than, than your, your megacephalics. Um, but there also are, I guess this is maybe a good segue into something that's happening currently that I know there's a lot of debate about in both the conservation and I think captive side of things is the proposed listing of the megacephalic species i believe right. all all five of them based on similarity of appearance for esa um i'm, well, I'm sure you're yeah so well, maybe you can expand them, on that and... uh, four of them are proposed to be listed by similarity of appearance and the pearl map is the one that would be listed just as threatened so uh the way that would work then uh exploitation of any of them for something like the pet trade, which seems to be the uh, far and away the biggest um, exploitation problem that they have. Exploitation for the pet trade for any of them would be a violation of the Endangered Species Act. But in terms of writing and implementing a recovery plan, you would have that for the pearl map turtle, but it would not be required for the Pascagoula or the Alabama or Scambia or Barber's map turtles. Uh, so they would be protected against exploitation. Uh, I guess also, uh, I, I believe that the uh, consultation process with the Fish and Wildlife Service would not be invoked for the four threatened by similarity of appearance species. So any project on the Alabama River or the Conecuh River of Escambia Bay or Apalachicola River uh, would not be subject to a Fish and Wildlife Service consultation for those species. But any projects on the Pearl River, uh, you know, any plans for a new dam or, or anything like that on the Pearl River, uh, they would have to go to Fish and Wildlife Service and see what they would think about that regarding pearl map turtles. So, so what do you think about that? Do you think that there should be a separate sort of action plan for each species or do you think that that's, well, I, I, I actually uh, did a, uh, worked on a lot of those studies that uh, uh, gathered the data on the pearl and the Pascagoula map turtle. And my co-authors and I, when we published that, we suggested you could list them both as threatened. We were talking just about the pearl and the Pascagoula, uh, two species in southern Mississippi, and the pearl is also in two parishes of Louisiana. So we said you could list them both as threatened, 
And there's some uh, impetus for doing that in the, the fact that there are some older data from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, some older data suggesting that those species used to be comparable in number to the sawbacks, uh, more comparable than they are today. Today, it's more like a, a five to one ratio, five sawbacks to one megacephalic in those two rivers. Uh, so that was one option, but we also saw that the uh, status of the pearl map turtle was dramatically worse than the status of the Pascagoula map turtle. The Pascagoula map turtle actually has some things going for it uh, in terms of uh, the structure of that river system, a lot of separate tributaries that come in that uh, actually have good populations or at least half decent populations of Pascagoula map turtles in those smaller tributaries. And a lot of those tributaries were um, not really even looked at until after the turn of the new millennium. One of my co-authors was Will Selman, and he found a lot of uh, uh, Pascagoula map turtles, Graptomys gibbons eye, up some of those tributaries where people had barely, if ever, looked for them. And you don't have those tributaries to the same extent on uh, the Pearl River system. The Pearl is a tributary poor system. The Pascagoula is a tributary rich system. Uh, even on the main stem rivers, though, the, uh, the ratio of sawback to megacephalic is uh, a little closer to one-to-one -one on the Pascagoula. It's not one-to-one, -one, but it's closer to it on the Pascagoula. And uh, so, you know, based on that, we suggested that, that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service might want to list the... Uh, Pearl map turtle is threatened and then lists the Pascagoula as threatened by similarity of appearance. The reason being, uh, even taxonomists weren't able to tell them apart until 2010. That's when Pearlensis was split away from Gibbon's eye. Uh, so to ask law enforcement officials to be able to tell the difference if somebody had a pearl map turtle and they said oh no 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 I got this from the Pascagoula River it's a it's a gibbon's eye not a pearlensis well uh, a lot of those uh, law enforcement folks would have a hard time telling the difference and uh, I was a little bit surprised but not uh, not annoyed or anything that they said well let's do this with all the megacephalics even barbari barbari has never been considered conspecific with the other four species. The other four species were all, for a long time, considered uh, one species, Graptomy pulchra. Now pulchra is in the uh, Mobile Bay drainages and Ernstite in the Escambia Bay, Gibbons Eye and the Pascagoula, and finally Pearlensis got split away as of 2010. So, uh, so I thought, well, that's that's. That's a modification of one of our two suggestions that we made uh, in our article about the abundance. But the key thing is the, the one megacephalic that seems to uh, have, have had the most impact on it, the pearl map turtle, it's going to be protected under this proposal that they've made. So it, it would be listed as threatened and then uh, it will be interesting to see what will come of that in the way of a recovery plan and what will come of that in the way of uh, funding to do some further studies to look more at pearl map turtles and uh, get more information and, and maybe uh, try out some things to see if they result in uh, any kind of stabilization or even population increase for these species. So uh, looking forward to seeing that story unfold in the coming years. So what are the things, sort of the, the impacts that are causing these declines? I've heard certain people that, that uh, I'm not sure that they've actually like done these surveys 
and, and what this entails, but they think that potentially the type of survey used, what like visual versus actually using traps and such could give you kind of dis differences in, in, in measurements that could be just due to sampling versus actual abundance. But I, maybe what are the factors causing the declines and, and how could survey influence counts, right? Well, the, the factors are largely speculation. You know, if only somebody had been studying these graptomies back uh, more continuously, let's say, studying them uh, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. You had people who were conducting some studies, uh, but uh, they, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of ecology in some of those studies. It was, you know, collecting specimens and determining things about the distribution, a little bit of relative abundance sort of data, but uh, uh, not a great deal on subjects like diet and habitat conditions and the effects of uh, uh, things like stream channelization or gravel mining or or what have you, or effects on the turtles themselves, effects on the, uh, uh, the prey base. We know that a lot have been taken for the pet trade, but we don't really have great information that you could rely on as to where they were taken from. Uh, if you wanted to conduct a study to compare heavily exploited graptomy sites on the Gulf Coast with relatively unexploited unex populations, you really wouldn't know where to go and where to look to do that. So uh, we imagine that removing individuals from the wild for the pet trade has been certainly deleterious for them. There's good reason to believe that would be the case with turtles, especially megacephalic females that may take 10 to 15 years to reach sexual maturity. If people are taking those for the pet trade, uh, that that's bound to be harmful. Uh, but overall, we just suspect that uh, the pet trade and some uh, various forms of degradation of river habitat have been the causes of some of the declines. The declines themselves are a little bit tenuous because we're looking at old data that is kind of fragmentary. It's not ideal. It's not uh, the kind of uh, uh, data we wish people had been collecting back decades ago. But of course, that's all we have. We can't go back and collect the data we wish we had from all those years ago. Uh, now, in terms of this question of survey techniques, trapping versus uh, doing visual surveys with, uh, you can either take binoculars or a spotting scope to bridges and boat ramps and public parks along the river and, and count turtles that way, or you can put a boat into a water and you can get a much bigger chunk of your river for your effort by just putting in somewhere and take your boat upstream uh, five miles, 10 miles, and count turtles as you go. Um, I, I've always advocated the visual surveys. I've done a lot of work with them, but I've always advocated them for the fact that you can cover a lot of territory. Uh, it, it is a lot of work putting in at a site and putting out traps, tending the traps, building up a good sample. You know, if you're, if you're going up and down the river in your boat, tending your traps, <clears throat> at the end of a good day, uh, I've always considered a double digit day a good day. If I catch 10 turtles in a day, I, I've, uh, I've earned my dinner. And so, you know, 10, 15, 20 turtles caught in a day in the process of catching them in your traps, you've seen many dozens of turtles as you've taken your boat up and down the river. Uh, and so I, for getting a, a quick look at status, I like the idea of 
uh, going to a lot of different sites, many different bridges and boat ramps and public parks and getting out with your binoculars or your spotting scope and counting turtles. And uh, you could, if you said, I'll trap all these spots, that would take weeks and weeks and weeks. But I can visit, depending on the, uh, uh, the river drainage, I can stop at 10 to 20 places in a day and count turtles. Uh, so it's, it's a nice rapid assessment technique. Of course, if you want to study reproduction, don't do that from a bridge. And if you want to study diet, don't do that from a bridge. Get out in a boat, catch some turtles, find where they're nesting, and uh, catch some to, to do your dietary study. Um, and, and it also makes sense to do uh, some trapping to look at relative abundance relative to some of the other species that you tend to see less of. Uh, so the other amidids that occur with graptomies, they'll generally bask a fair amount, although I have been places where my traps catch a lot more red-eared sliders than what I see. There, there are some places on rivers where the sliders are just not as invested in, in basking, but most of the amidids do pretty well. Kinosternids, colledrids, uh, uh, you don't see very many of them basking. You'll see it once in a while, but it's not an efficient way to gather data on any sort of information about them other than maybe you know getting a, an occasional new county record that way. Uh, and the soft shells, Apollone, they're somewhere in between. They'll show themselves, they'll bask, and they do a lot of floating at the surface. Uh, that aquatic basking as it's called. So you'll see a fair number of them, uh, but if you want to know more about the relative abundance, you've got to get out and use a variety of traps and see what you catch. And uh, you know, if you have an area where graphemies numbers are not doing so well, is that also true of the river cooters? Is that also true of the soft shells? Is it also true of uh, some of the kinosternids like razorback musk turtles? Or are you just so far up a uh, tributary or so far upstream on the main stem river that it's not great graptomies habitat anymore and all of a sudden you're catching lots and lots of river cooters and sliders uh, and starting to get you know things like stink bots and caledra and things that you wouldn't get very much of uh, uh, further down the drainage. So, uh, so, so the trapping is certainly, it certainly has its place. Uh, uh, I try to do a lot of both be going out in the field, uh, uh, as we get into summer here later this month, and I'll be taking some traps with me, but also taking my binoculars and spotting scope with me and getting data both ways. That's interesting. Um, so I get one of the things too, a lot of the early like basking surveys, uh, also, yeah, like relative abundance with respect to the other, for, for the two species in Mississippi, at least, the abundance with respect to the sympatric um, microcephalic species, the, it seems like those, based on my understanding, it doesn't seem like they've declined, maybe it's precipitously, or is it sort of proportional, or, or maybe the diet, right, of the, the mol, more molluscivorous species are suffering because of some something related to that? I mean, we suspect that it's diet, uh, and just, uh, you know, knowing uh, how many endangered mollusks we have in the eastern and central United States, right. uh, uh, mussels in particular, also some, many of the aquatic snails, uh, knowing how their populations have declined, to have a species that relies on them to have seen a decline in, in their populations uh, uh, would not be unexpected. So we suspect that that's a lot of it. Of course, you mentioned the corbicula, the Asian clams that are invasive. Uh, that's what a lot of the mega and the mesocephalic females are eating these days and uh, they're plentiful 
can see that just in what they leave in a bucket of water overnight. They're plentiful in their environment. They don't seem to be having any problem in finding them. Uh, is their nutritional value the same? We don't have any information on that. We don't know. Uh, could, could something about uh, nutritional value be related to declines? Or is it more proper to look at it and say, well, the, you know, thank goodness for the corbicula, at least they're keeping them at a shadow of their former abundance. So uh, that that's also is uh, a plausible hypothesis. Uh, uh, maybe if, if we had had native mollusk declines to the extent that we had, and we didn't have invasive corbicula in the south and zebra mussels up here where I am, maybe our graptomese populations would be in much worse states of decline. Again, it goes back to uh, some of the older data. Uh, I, I'm, I work with uh, common map turtles up at Presque Isle on Lake Erie. We have a very abundant population of them. Uh, the females, the males to a small extent, but the females to a very large extent subsist on zebra and quagga mussels that showed up in Lake Erie in the mid 1980s. And I would love to have information about these turtles diet from before the 1980s. I would love to have information on their abundance. The only thing I've ever gotten about their abundance was I talked to somebody who uh, has a houseboat on one of the lagoons up at Presque Isle family houseboat that goes back for generations and uh, he told me oh uh, those turtles were super abundant before the zebra mussels got here so they're super abundant today they're a, they're a wildlife spectacle basically today there's so many of them uh, but at least according to one person I talked to years ago that's the way it was even before the zebra mussels got there. I, I would love it if I could find somebody's uh, old photographs or counts or something, something comparable to what we have in more contemporary data, but it just doesn't seem to exist. So I think, you know, hopefully 50 years from today when people are getting interested in studying graptomese populations, they'll be able to look back and say, well, we, it's not perfect, but we have a lot of good data from, uh, you know, the, the 1990s and the early 2000s that we can compare our data to and have some idea of how these populations are doing. Uh, but, you know, for freshwater turtles, maybe there ought to be something uh, comparable to the Christmas bird counts, uh, something like that, where people go out, take their binoculars and their spotting scopes and count basking turtles and uh, keep a, a record of some of the numbers that they're seeing and then we can spot some trends a lot better. Uh, if going forward with the graptomies, it would be good to get more of this ecological information about uh, the prey base and how it's doing and how that relates to how uh, abundant or how sparse these turtles are. Yeah, I guess um, one thing that I'm especially concerned about, especially on a local scale, um, is the, you know, the, the sediments that are caused by construction. Um, we read a paper in 2015 that was nailed right outside of Dr. Mears' office that was a, a spatial ecology paper on barber map turtles and how they prefer these finer substrates. And right. we think, you know, it's very possible that these, you know, constru construction silt that's like polluting the water, they could also obscure the, you know, their prey, like all the mollusks, and that could sure. lead to a lot of habitat degradation. When I was studying the Pearl and Pascagoula map turtles, I, uh, as part of the funding I got for that from the Fish and Wildlife Service, I got a, uh, a grab dredge that has these big jaws on it, you drop it down into the river bottom, 
and there's a device to make the jaws close and it takes a big bite out of the river bottom and it it kept running into uh, dead wood and snagging on the dead wood and it, it ultimately I couldn't get good data out of it uh, but if somebody can figure out a way to get good data on mollusk abundance and relate that to the abundance of these megacephalics uh, with something like the sawbacks. Uh, all three sawbacks are very reliant on sponges in their diet. So if there's a way to sample uh, the sponges that they're nibbling on or growing on the submerged part of the same branches that they're basking on. So, you know, the high and dry part of the branches, they're basking perched to sun themselves. And then down below the water, that's where they're grazing. That's their salad bar uh, with sponges and algae and aquatic insects and things like that. And so uh, somebody could do a good job of figuring out how to, how to take data on the abundance of the food uh, in, and then compare that among different habitats, try to relate that to the abundance of the turtle. I think that has the potential to be a very interesting study. But the problem is how do you get good data on something like that? Uh, the uh, uh, river ecosystem is uh, it's a pretty wild ecosystem with all the rise and fall in water levels that you have to deal with when you're out uh, studying these turtles, uh, uh, that could make for a kind of an interesting situation. Yeah, it'd be just, something. It I was going to back track towards like methods. Uh, when when it's available, what do you think of snor just hand catching hand catching turtles when the when you have the opportunity? Uh, I, that has not worked terribly well for me. I, I tried a lot of that with my studies of Graptomys versa, the Texas map turtle, studying it back in 1998, 99, and 2000 in uh, the South Llano River. Very clear water river, so I got, uh, I, I had snorkeling equipment and uh, uh, tried just looking around under the water, seeing what I could find. Very little luck doing that. I uh, caught a few turtles, but very few. Uh, the big series I mentioned earlier, the 42 turtles had, that were collected back in 1949, they were all collected by three people wading the river on one morning in 1949. The uh, professor who had two students with him was uh, Bryce Brown at Baylor University. I actually got a chance to talk to him when he was in his 19, he was in his 80s. It was in 1998, I guess. I was headed to the river. So he had been retired for several years, but still lived near Baylor. And uh, I went to his home and talked with him. He said, yeah, we just walked the river and we're in knee deep to waist deep water and seeing turtles and I thought this was going to be the greatest field study ever and it took me a, almost a full day to drive from there to where the field site was on the South Llano and I got out started walking the river and uh, all I found that first night was a stink pot I thought okay well I'm really going to clean up tomorrow morning when I get out here and I walked and walked and I didn't even have any traps with me because I had heard that this was the, the way to catch them. Uh, so I was down there uh, catching turtles off the bottom that first year in 1998. And I just caught a handful in like two weeks time. Uh, it was not efficient at all. And then I, I got snorkeling gear later and tried, uh, you know, looking under the water and figured maybe I'd see things better. I saw things better, but they were all rocks and I was not finding the turtles. So, uh, so that didn't work. I tried some snorkeling on the Whiskey Chitto River for Sabine map turtles. Uh, pretty clear river there, a lot of springs feeding into that river, which makes for a clear, cleaner, clearer river. 
I couldn't find them that way. I know people have done that with like Barbara's map turtle and some of the tributaries of their system. Uh, but it wasn't working for me. Of course, most of the rivers that I work on are fairly murky and, you know, you get two feet under the surface, you're not going to see anything except the hand in front of your face. Uh, so it wouldn't work at all in a river like that. But uh, if you can make it work, then uh, uh, I, I was just uh, reading an article today about a river in the Ozarks where Graptomese Geographica has been studied for years with snorkeling. Uh, I guess if you can make it work in certain habitats, that's great. Uh, it has never been uh, something that worked really well for me. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's... Go ahead. I think Jack's on a bit of a delay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, some of the screens are coming through a bit. Like you guys say something and then it's a bit delayed afterwards. But uh, yeah, I, I was asking that question mainly because that's that's how I found – that's how I got them in hand in New Jersey. But compared to the amount I actually saw basking, it was like a ridiculous <laughs> – it had been a ridiculous ratio. I, I got less than 10 in hand, and I had to have seen just dozens and dozens – paddling the whole river all day and uh yeah. i would i'd get in at the best sites and i'm like oh i'm gonna find tons of them underwater and i get down there and they they, they must be just really good at hiding underwater it's yeah, probably just not good as good at hiding uh one thing i've always thought would be a, a fun thing to do is uh nobody really has uh described in any kind of detail the fleeing behavior of map turtles. So, you know, if you have a log that attracts lots of turtles, and if you have water clarity underneath that log that's good enough, if you could set up an underwater camera of some sort, and then a couple of times a day, scare all the turtles off and look at where they go, because I, I honestly couldn't really tell you, uh, other than the observation a lot of people have made is that hatchlings often just bob back to the surface. They, some of them don't seem to be able to get under the water very effectively. So sometimes they'll come right back up. They don't seem to go very far, but the, the bigger adults, are they, are they just going straight down to the bottom and staying there until they think all is clear? Or are they going down in the water? I know they're going downward, there's a very downward trajectory to where they're headed when they jump off their basking perch. But are they going downward and then heading upstream, downstream, or toward the deeper center of the river or somewhere? Uh, that would that would be very interesting to know. And then uh, and then you know also looking at what they do before they reemerge. They will come back eventually. Uh, and so what are they doing to be wary about reemerging? Once they start reemerging, all of a sudden, in a lot of cases anyway, all of a sudden there's a, a, a mass movement back onto the basking substrate. And uh, so how, you know, what, what are they doing that lets them feel like, okay, now it's safe to go back to what we were doing? Sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 45 minutes, uh, but they will come back. And That's actually really, oh, sorry. I think I, the delay might have interfered with that. Oh, but uh, I kind of have a bit of, I wouldn't say it's really an answer, but just what I saw in, in the river is, this area was devoid of uh, grass or anything like that. I think like, I didn't even, I suspected if the eelgrass was around, that's where they'd go. But right here, it was, uh, this is the only time I actually got any in hand either was we came to this bend in the river where it varies from like six inches deep to like 10 feet. And uh, this is a really deep, slow moving turn. It's really clear. And there's a, like a very tall tree that has fallen and it's laying like, it's laying like parallel to the shoreline. And uh, all of like several, several of them, like probably five or six were basking on it. Like, okay, this is like a good spot to try and get under the water and get them. And of course, 
by the time I see them from like a hundred plus yards away, they're under the water. And yeah. we parked the kayaks. I searched the bottom, and uh, I was just trying to like looking for them in the ways I'd look for other turtles, like musk turtles and things. And mm-hmm. I eventually found them, but it's not like they were all in one area. Like every map turtle I saw basking had all come under this one little. Like there were all these dead parts of the trees that still had leaves on them, and this one created an area on the bottom that was about like this would have been the river bottom, and this is how it created like a little weird shelf that oh. they all hit, hit under. And I just kept I, I like looked under, and they were all staring back at me, and I was like, oh, so I guess they yeah. kind of stuck in the group or something, and I managed to just pick them all up at that point. But uh, yeah, that kind of uh, more than may answer. May very was, well be some. Uh, fairly undescribed social aspects. Uh, uh, you, you can't study craptomies or some of the other emitids that like to bask a lot, like painted turtles and sliders and river cooters. You can't study them for, for very long before you start thinking they must be really social in some fashion. Uh, they aggregate to such an extent and, you know, one of the explanations for their aggregation on a basking substrate, it could be, well, that's the only really good basking substrate around. Uh, they're all coming to that one because it has really deep water and good hiding spots under it. And they're cognizant of the need to be able to get away from danger. And some of the other logs and branches I'm seeing with without any turtles on them, uh, maybe the, they're in water that's too shallow or uh, there's too much debris underneath them or something like that, and they're, they're just not as good a spot. But the other possibility is once uh, one turtle comes out, other turtles see that and they say, I'll go over there and, and we'll have uh, two sets of eyes and then other turtles will show up and we'll have three sets and four sets of eyes looking for danger and uh, we can react to each other when it's time to flee into the water. Uh, so th- there, there's a quite a suggestion of a social aspect to the basking and maybe as you're saying, maybe there's a social aspect to where they go and hide uh, when uh, something shows up that makes them leave their basking site, uh, but it has not been well studied, looked at. I think you could do some really nice controlled experimentation where you could put out equivalent basking substrates uh, in roughly equivalent habitats as far as water depth and the other things that are around, and uh, just see if they don't aggregate at one before they start to go to the other or do they just randomly start popping up on each of those substrates uh right now you know without without a controlled experimentation it's hard to distinguish between those two hypotheses are they aggregating in big numbers on certain logs and branches because that's the ideal spot to flee from maybe also the ideal spot to climb up on in the first place or are they aggregating because they want to be together and they want to have uh, you know that group effect uh, i like the second hypothesis better than the first but uh, we don't have the information to really distinguish between the two and so some controlled experimentation with basking sites would be a really neat it'd be a nice master's thesis or uh, PhD dissertation topic for somebody, I think. It's it's tough to do these things, I think, with, with mesocosms, too, in terms of, like, like I'm I, a lot of the research in, in looking at invasive species with sliders and other turtles, that they're, they're sort of a mesocosmic. It's, it's not actually, like, I, actually measuring these things in situ is very challenging. Right. Uh, it, but I think that immediately when you remove them from the natural environment you're in, you're kind of removing so many different parameters that could be affecting how the dynamic there that it, it becomes almost maybe sort of a negligible comparison to what's actually happening. Right. Yeah. Um, but so we're starting to sort of come up on time. We don't want to go too long because we've also got a little, 
uh, trivia we like to do at the end just for our right. fun. And as Carl Franklin put it, uh, just to showcase some of the knowledge that is sort of useless, I guess, <laughs> about turtles. Um, right. Yeah, but so we'll get to that. We've also got um, some listener questions, I think. Maybe Jason and Ken can pull those up real fast fast maybe we can do a little speed question and answer i don't know if that sounds sure, I've good got a couple of, um like a couple that are actually hand in hand uh some viewer questions for you um one is like what's your favorite thing about map turtles and then another question that kind of goes hand in hand with that is like what's the most unique thing about map turtles all right i uh, i think my favorite thing uh, about map turtles is that uh, they have uh, they've given me a lifetime's worth of excuses to get out in my canoe on rivers. I, I grew up in Oklahoma City and we would go over to eastern Oklahoma, which is more river rich, the more river rich part of Oklahoma and do some canoeing. I actually saw some graptomies before I even knew what graptomies were. I remember very distinctly at the age of maybe 10 years old, canoeing past a big aggregation of about 20 that must have been little males because they were all fairly small. And then uh, doing that on the Illinois River in eastern Oklahoma. So I really enjoyed that growing up. And for a time when I was college age, I didn't have a canoe and finally got one when I started doing uh, graptomy studies in Kentucky while I was there and uh, uh, getting out and paddling on a river. River habitats, for whatever reason, just are much more uh, attractive to me than lakes or marine habitats or you know, desert or mountains or anything like that. I, I would rather be out on a river, preferably a river getting kind of down near the coast somewhere uh, like the Gulf Coast. I would rather be out doing that than just about anything. So uh, with all the map turtles and all the questions that we have. I'm never going to run out of questions that we can ask about map turtles in our in the research that I do. So uh, the fact that they give me that excuse to uh, keep doing something I've loved all my life, uh, doing a lot of it, uh, that's got to be my favorite thing about them. As far as the most unique thing about them, I'd have to say it's the sexual size dimorphism, and I have to credit a colleague, uh, Patrick Stevens, who did some emited phylogeny and uh, emited ecological work uh, some years ago. He was the person that pointed out, I hadn't realized this, but among all the tetrapods, the graptomies are probably the most size dimorphic species that there are. There are a few uh, turtle species over in India that we don't really have great data on or that they may be comparable in sexual size differences. But uh, Patrick Stevens looked at throughout mammals and birds, snakes and lizards, crocodilians. There are, uh, there are no other species uh, the uh, amphibians as well, salamanders, frogs, toads, Sicilians, there are no other species that have this size difference that map turtles and sawbacks have. The megacephalics, uh, you know, going back to that earlier discussion about their large body size, the males are not terribly large among males, you know, comparing them to other males, but the females are uh, uh, they're really, really large, and they're, of course, the ones that have the big heads. So they have the greatest sexual size dimorphism. The megacephalics, typically the female, the uh, size of mature females, on average, is about two and a half times the size of the adult males if we're looking at length of the shell. 
Well, two and a half times longer is going to mean about two and a half times wider. It probably means a little more than two and a half times taller because females of so many turtles are a little more high domed uh, for producing the eggs than the male. Males tend to be a little bit flatter. So uh, even if it's just two times longer, like in uh, maybe in the sawbacks, for example, or, or my common map turtles at Presque Isle, the average adult female is about twice the length of the average male. But twice as long is twice as wide is twice as high. That's two times two times two. That's like eight, nine, ten times the mass in females than in the males. So I, I just, uh, I, I love all the times that I've had a, uh, a few map turtles in a, one of my plastic bins in my boat and somebody at a boat ramp is looking at what I'm doing in my research and they come over and look in the bin and they say, oh, look, the little baby one. They say, no, check out that tail. He's, he's fully loaded, ready to rock and roll. That is a full grown adult male. And uh, oftentimes I'll pick up a, a, an adult male and an adult female, and I'll say, now in the next 10 or 20 years, if they live that long, which of course they may, uh, she's going to grow more than he's going to grow. You know, she might put on another inch and a half. He, he will be lucky to put on more than a half an inch in the next decade or two. Uh, and that just blows people's minds to think that the males are tiny and the, the females uh, so much larger. I had a student one time who went into middle, middle school teaching and I came and did a presentation for her class and talked about map turtles and other types of turtles, but I was talking about the size difference. And she said, now imagine, imagine your mother is the size that she is, but your father pretty much stopped growing when he was in kindergarten. That's how craptomies are. And all the kids who are sitting there, all these middle school kids going, whoa, and they, you could see them all thinking in their mind's eye, what if mother and father size differences in humans were like that? And uh, so uh, that, that has to be the most unique thing. There are a number of unique things, uh, a number of really compelling things. As I was saying earlier, it's the kind of thing that makes me think, you know, why weren't there more graptomy studies done back, you know, even before I was born or when I was a little kid? Uh, how did I get so lucky to be able to study so many things about these turtles that I've been able to study about them in my career uh, and not get scooped 20, 30, 40 years before uh, I came onto the scene? So. Another thing I love about Craptomies, they give me all that opportunity. Maybe we can do a few more questions and then we'll, we can get to our, our trivia here. Michael, remember uh, you, We I think we both did a post at some point. because Yes, Richard I had, think we're... You know what I'm about to talk about? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Pritchard had uh, many Barber's Map Turtle uh, like skeleton, skeletal remains in his collection of both males and females. He had a particularly large female that was like something like 12 or 12.5 inches in length, like something ridiculous, like huge. And her skull was almost the same size as a mature male's carapace. Like we just found that like just yeah. hilarious. Like it's, 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 that's uh, so comical. Like it's, yeah. I, uh, the largest female I measured was a, a specimen in the Tulane collections uh, that had a head width at the upper jaw, 71 millimeters, and the smallest mature male with a big tail had a plastron length of 68 millimeters. So his plastron length was not her head width. Uh, and so plastron I, length, I, I so. about Barber's map turtles, uh, and it's, I've not gotten to do this yet. But one day, my one of my professional goals is to observe them mating in the wild. I've just got to see 
how they pair up with they they have the biggest size difference. They're a little bit more size dimorphic, just a little bit more, but a little bit more than Ernst Eye and Gibbons Eye and Perlensis. Uh, so that that would be interesting to see uh, and kind of comical to see. I I've got to ask before we get to this next question: Is there a consensus for if I guess over kind of within the radiation of the genus have females gotten larger than the common ancestor or have males gotten smaller? My analyses on that question, uh, uh, in that herpetologica article that I put out in 2008, I think the males have gotten small. Uh, if you compare them to other emitids that have some size dimorphism, but not nearly as much, uh, the females are fairly comparable. They're maybe even a little bit small compared to things like sliders, trachomies, and pseudomies. A little bit bigger than uh, uh, painted turtles, at least most populations of painted turtles and uh, chicken turtles, comparable to the, uh, the diamondback terrapins, of course. But the females, their body size is not anything that astounds anybody one way or the other those little dinky males though they're uh they're always subject uh, of a comment or two uh if the females were like them they'd be competitors for the smallest turtles in the world you know along with uh bog turtles and some of the uh some of the tortoises of south africa and species like that they'd be competing for smallest turtles in the world. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have a few more questions? We can go with the maybe the best ones. Not <laughs> maybe. Um, I could see. Um, Ken, did you want to ask like a couple? Or, or... we've answered a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so I mean. We could move into the trivia then, because yeah, if, if yeah. sure, sure, okay, let's do that. So, uh, we we can do this two different ways, I guess. Uh, you could ask us questions, Doctor Lindemann, or we can uh, do a little. We can do a volley both ways if you want. Uh, I have a so. few uh, grab to me trivia questions, and I'll I'll see what I can do to answer your questions too. But uh, how about we start out with uh, which of the fourteen grab to me species? appeared in a biological illustration that was published 97 years before that species was described and given its scientific name. So this is a multiple choice question, but there are 14 answers possible. <laughs> Which of the species appeared in a biological illustration 97 years prior to its official taxonomic description. Okay, so I, 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 I had one good. that I'm thinking of, but I don't yeah. think this is quite right. There's a certain one that's older than a hundred, uh, more than a hundred, but I'm, I'm trying to, hmm. So there's only so many, so we can eliminate about five of them immediately. Mm -hmm. um, ooh, so, yeah, I wonder, this is thinking, the, I wonder if we're thinking similar ones. Well, I, yeah, it's the one I'm thinking of. I think might be too recent. Um, well, let's think about this a bit more. Okay, so the fir the first me megacephalic. I don't think that that could be the case. I've I've got an idea for this. So, so the Bauer ones would be too early for the one I'm thinking of. And I, I, I could be totally off, but I, I've got an idea. I don't know. Someone might have a better idea here. I don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't want to sacrifice our, 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 our random turtle knowledge. Um, if you have an idea, I mean, I'd say, you know, go ahead and say it because it's probably better than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well. Right. That we um, have. Jack's got you have an idea, Jack. Do you you want to maybe I, I might be wrong. Uh, okay. I how about this because we can't 
No, we I'll. I could just say it. I get like say it, and then I will say what I'm thinking, and we can get right. full. We could. All right. I was gonna say. I was gonna say Gizai. Gibbons eye. I. It I was. I was thinking, thinking of Megacephalus. Be a map turtle. I, I oh. was thinking Ernst eye. All right. It's not one of the Megacephalics. Oh, okay. I guess we're both wrong. <laughs> That throws a little bit of a loop. Somebody might uh, guess Pearlensis because they didn't get their official description until 2010. That's what I was initially thinking, but yeah. I, I know that the yeah. nearest prior to that would be 1913, and then I don't know of any Graptomies uh, related publications from anywhere in the vicinity of 1913. There was not a lot happening with Graptomies in the early, early 1900s. So it's, not that. Hmm. Okay. So we're natural <laughs> direction to go in, but it's not one of the five megacephalics. Ninety-seven years. That's almost a century prior to its description. Maybe Sabinensis. Uh, <laughs> Sabinensis. Uh, uh, described in 1953, so that would go back to 18. No, that's too early. You're off by one year, though. You're off by one year, so we're looking at a species described in 1954 that appeared in, in print okay. in, a, in a lithograph. How many of our audience even know what a lithograph is? I'm not even sure I know what a lithograph is. Okay, so I know who who did this. It was probably Agassiz, right? It was. What's that? Was it in one of Agassiz's? Yes. Lithograph? Okay. Fifty-seven, and then formally described in 1954. <laughs> so in in his book, there is a, a lithograph of a hatchling and it's called Graptomies Oculifera. It's Oculifera, isn't it? It's not Oculifera. Oh. <laughs> okay, the uh, it's Nigronoma, right? Right. 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 Nigronoma. Okay. Nigronoma. 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 So he called it Graptomies lusuri. Lusuri, it turns out, is a junior synonym of Pseudogeographica. Uh, but uh, it's uh, very clearly a black knob sawback. And it's just in the lithograph. There's no real information about it uh, or discussion about it. And uh, it just turns out that he somehow had gotten a hold of a specimen that he could have described as new if he had maybe uh, taken a little closer look at it. Well, that was a good. That was a good question. Was, was I, good I was one. thinking something by Bauer in the late 1890s, and that that could be one yeah. of the megacephalics. But yeah. That's good. All right. I guess we <laughs> we can we can do some here. I don't know if anyone's got uh, I mean just in the interest of time, maybe you could just give us your Graptomies questions. That might be the best way to go. Uh how how about uh Fred Cagle? So he's in uh southern Illinois initially, but then he comes to Tulane University uh and spent the rest of his career there. And when he comes to Tulane, um, his, he becomes interested in graptomies. He must have uh, done a little bit of work with graptomies in Illinois, or at least caught a few along the way with all his slider studies he was doing up there. But he comes to Tulane, he gets interested in graptomies. And he realizes as of the late 1940s, when he joined the faculty there, as of the late 1940s, there had been uh, two species, Oculifera and Pulchra, that had been described by Georg Bauer back in the early 1890s, uh, based on specimens collected by Gustav Kohn. Which turned out, it turned out those specimens were in the Tulane collection. And so Cagle takes his students out to rediscover these species between the 1890s when their descriptions were published and the 1940s when he gets to Tulane. 
nobody has published any new information whatsoever on oculifera or pulchra. And so the first thing he has to do is find where they live. And my question is, how did he know to take his students to the Pearl River to look for these species? How did he know to go to the Pearl River? Because the, uh, the descriptions that Bauer published said nothing about Pearl River. So how was he directed to go there? And of course, back in his day, Polkra was considered, uh, uh, well, it, based on his work, actually, Polkra was considered to live in multiple rivers. But they've now been split up. But Well, and Bauer was pretty bad, I seem to recall, at getting back to people and then ended up going crazy and sent to a mental institution. Or... Yeah, uh, he, uh, that, that was... Uh, uh, a, a really telling thing for me while I was working on that book because <laughs> I passed through the age of 48, which is the age he was when he, from the descriptions that I've read, it sounds like he worked himself to death working on turtles. And when I was 48, I was working myself practically to death writing that book. So that was a cautionary tale for me to kind of take it easy and make sure I survive this book. Uh, uh, so, and, and Bauer had not collected the specimens. He had uh, bought them from uh, Gustav Kohn and Kohn said that he uh, got at least some of the specimens he had, he got from a uh, market in New Orleans. Somebody else had caught them. Yeah, so I th this is a challenging one because there's so many different things. I, I've got just a wild guess, but I, I'm not sure the like, concrete. I don't know anyone else want to take a shot at it. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I was thinking of something, but I don't think I, I think I'd probably just be wrong. I'd probably I'd be probably off. I don't know. I, I, I was thinking that one of those may have had something written on the bottom of the shell or something like that that, that denoted. The, uh, uh, the specimens that Cone had gotten a hold of and sent to Bauer, one or the other of those individuals had written Pearl River in, must be India ink, and still on them. I've seen the specimens. Uh, I've got one of the specimens photographed in the book and written in India ink, Pearl River. And one of them also mentions a railroad. And I think I've been to that railroad crossing. It, there's a railroad bridge right next to the I-59 bridge on the Pearl River, West Pearl River. And I think that's probably, uh, uh, this, probably the same railroad area uh, coming through there where they had collected these specimens. So that's the official type locality for uh, oculifera, the ring sawback. It's not for pulchra but because the what we consider pulchra today was based on specimens collected uh, even before that in the 1870s over in the, uh, on the Alabama River or near the Alabama River. The only reason I, I, I managed to pull that one is because I remember that photo from the book and it just kind of, I don't know. <laughs> that that was, uh, was something to, to see. And I think Cagle might mention that in his 1953 article about uh, oculifera that, where he wrote up uh, uh, the rediscovery of that species there. I think he might have mentioned that there, so I, I may have known I was going to see that when I saw those specimens at the Tulane collection, but uh, uh, that's a nice little historical detail. Yes, that's very interesting. All right, maybe one more question, and then we can okay. sort of wrap up. Uh, one more question. Which U.S. state or Canadian province, and there are 30 states and two provinces that have graptomies in them, but which U.S. state or Canadian province 
has the largest number of native graptomy species within it? And what number are we talking? Which state would you visit if you wanted to see the most graptomies? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Mississippi. Okay. And because I know you can find at least you can find at least four, possibly five, with possibly more at least five. I can't think because I know geographical, like at least what. There are, polka, there are polka in Mississippi, too. Barely. Okay, that would be six that I'm thinking of. Six and... Uh, so all three pairs of sawback and megacephalic are in Mississippi. Oh, so I was lowballing that's, the answer. That's six, but it doesn't end at six. So do you have... Is it, is it uh, pseudo-geographica or like sabinensis that comes in from the western part of the state uh, not sabinensis that'd be too far away way way yeah. over it watch is there uh, okay Africa, yeah. uh pseudogeographica coni if you like subspecies there is there so that makes eight and then the ninth species was just recently discovered way up in the northeasternmost county and just barely into Mississippi, the ninth species part Geograph uh, oh. geographica. Yeah, it's part of the uh, Tennessee River system. Uh, there's a little side creek or side tributary that has a nice little population in Tishomingo County. So nine out of the 14 in Mississippi Second to Mississippi is Alabama with six. And then uh, third is Texas. And fourth is uh, uh, Texas has five graptomy species. And then let's see, Louisiana and Tennessee are tied for fourth with four species. So just recently discovered that Tennessee does get Polka are just barely over the state line. Well, that's, that, actually, that's, that's actually crazy. That's like two thirds of the whole genus in one state. Like yeah. that you, you can technically get yeah. Mississippi. Uh, if you haven't been to Mississippi with your binoculars and your scope, you need to schedule a trip because you can do some really nice work uh, driving around. That's that's how I got really started. I was in Western Kentucky working with uh, getting some Wachitensis and Pseudogeographica out of uh, Kentucky Lake, which is the dammed up Tennessee River. But I would do my field work up there just waiting for the opportunity to take a drive down and drive around in southern Mississippi. And I started taking trips and, uh, well, I have not officially stopped taking those trips as of yeah, but I was doing that when I was working on my PhD years ago in the uh, in the early 1990s. My first trip to Mississippi was 1991. So, uh, I have yeah. not done that. Well worth uh, the travel time to get out there on some of those rivers and see some of these spots. As far as traveling, I've done Mississippi's always been just out of reach because but I'd want to get, I wanted to get there for a while because well, it's, it's just a haven. A lot of life listing you can do there. Yes. I've been once for graptomies, but for about half a day. So yeah, definitely a lot more to see, but I think we're kind of coming up on time. We try to, obviously we could, I think talk for, for ages. <laughs> we were, yeah. I think we were even did to talk about some like allometry and such, but we'll have to save that for another time. Uh, but it's been it's been awesome to talk with you today, Dr. Lindemann. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I think we've all I've I've certainly learned a lot, and and it's been cool to get your perspective on a lot of things. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Well, glad to do it, and thanks for having me on. Always good to talk turtles. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Lindemann. That was uh this was probably one of my favorite episodes so far. I've, I've learned so much. I, I give all credit to the Graptomies for that. That's not me. That's grabbed me. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on. For anyone that's that's gone to this point, you can find us on our social media at the name Colonia Cast and the website. Definitely go check that out. But thank you guys. But we gotta we gotta make sure 